I want to give you seven spheres of wealth that you must focus on. You must be wealthy in seven areas or you will be poor. The first area of wealth is spiritual wealth. The Bible calls this being rich toward God. If your spiritual life is not in order and you have a billion dollars in the bank, you are poor. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose the most important thing he has? His soul. So you want to focus on wealth in your spirit life. The second sphere of wealth in the kingdom is solical wealth. Solical wealth means intellectual and emotional development. You must focus on developing yourself intellectually. God gave you a brain. He expects it to be developed. God gave you a brain with nothing in it. It's like a hard drive on a computer. It is up to you to decide what you download. It's called learning. It's important for you to become very wealthy in your soul. Your soul consists of your mind, your will, and your emotions. It is not to your benefit to have a billion dollars in the bank, but don't have the intelligence to invest it. Don't have the knowledge to multiply it. And don't have the wisdom to invest it. And that's why Solomon was smart. When God asked him, what do you want? I will give you anything you want. Solomon did not ask for money. He asked God for solical wealth. He said, give me knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Later on, Solomon wrote this in his book called Proverbs. He said, wisdom brings wealth. One of the students of Jesus, his name was John, wrote a little book that is tucked away in your Bible. It's 3 John. He said, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That means your health depends on your mental state. Your prosperity depends on your solical development. I always tell people when I train them in business that wealth is actually an idea. It's not money. Wealth has to be first in the mind. So you must be wealthy in your soul. The third sphere of wealth that you must focus on in the kingdom of God is what we call physical wealth. You know, it's interesting that Stephen Jobs, one of the richest men in the history of the world, who founded Apple Computer, he was worth hundreds of billions of dollars, but not one dollar could save him from cancer in his pancreas and his liver. He died with a billion dollars in the bank. He had material wealth, but he didn't have physical wealth. No matter how much you know, no matter how much you are talented and gifted, if your body breaks down, you are poor. This is why John said, I wish above all things that you may what? Prosper and be in health. Nothing is worse than laying on your back with some big ideas. You must become wealthy in your physical body. That means when you leave this place, you must make a decision to focus on becoming wealthy, healthy. You may wonder why God, when he created the nation of Israel, he gave them all kinds of wonderful laws. But then he focused on suddenly physical laws of their bodies. And he gave them an hygiene list. He gave them a health 
program. He gave them even specific foods to eat and would not to eat. He was focusing on the third area of wealth, your body. By God's grace, my wife and I and my children have not been sick for 36 years. Not one disease in our house. Now, of course, I live under the kingdom culture, but we also eat properly. We exercise. We drink good water, and we feed our minds good books and listen to good CDs and DVDs. All that is a part of my health. We even protect ourselves from negative company because that can affect your health. If you stay around people who complain all the time, finding fault all the time, always criticizing, you are in a diseased environment. You must prosper in your area of physical wealth. The fourth sphere of wealth is social wealth. We don't think about this sometimes. It's important for you to become wealthy in your friendships, wealthy in your family relationship, wealthy in your relationships with people in your environment. I can't stress how important this is. You are as poor as the friends you have. You are as wealthy as the friends you keep. If your marriage relationship is not working, you are sick. It's called social disease. If your relationship with your parents is negative and there's stress between you and your mother and your father, unforgiveness and anger, you are poor in your social wealth. This is why Jesus stressed, forgive those who offend you. Do good to those who despitefully use you. Pray for those who persecute you. Why? Keep the relationships pure for your own wealth. And then he says, do good to everyone. Do you know that your success may depend on someone who you don't like? Sometime you go to a bank to borrow money for your company, and the person who's in charge of the department is someone who you offended. And now they hold your life in their hands. Tell your neighbor, be nice to me. You might need me next week. Be wealthy in your relationships. Most of the time, you don't need money. You need people with money. Jesus was smart. He kept people around him who had access to resources. Some of you wonder why Jesus kept Mary around him. You know, the lady from Magdalene, the little village? The lady was loaded. She came and put money on his body. And based on the calculation of today's currency, it was between 15 and 18,000 US dollars. She had it in her pocket, in her pocket. He said, lady, I'm gonna heal you and stay with me. See, sometimes your problem is all your friends are poor. If you are poor and I'm poor, we are bad company. <laughs> Clap right there, somebody. <laughs> Joseph was in prison. Watch Joseph. Joseph is in jail, in prison. And Joseph knew, I have to develop some relationships here. I have no money. I have no favor. I'm in prison. I can't get out. So let me make some friends. That's your problem. You're making the wrong friends. Joseph decided to make friends with two people who knew Pharaoh. Sometimes it ain't what you know. It's relationship. And Joseph cultivated that relationship with those two people. And he told them, now look, we're friends. He even solved their problems. He interpreted their dreams for them. And he says, now when you come out, if you come out, remember me. And you remember what happened, eh? One of them came out and got his job back in the office of the president of Egypt. And when the government had a problem, he said to the president, to Pharaoh, I know a young man. Hey, boy, say, I know. I know. Say it again. I know. I know means relationship. You know what's wrong with you? The wrong people know you. I know a young man in prison who can solve your problem. It was a relationship that brought Joseph into prime ministership. Your relationships. My wife and I protect ourselves by loving one another. 
I must keep my marriage pure. I must keep my relationship strong with my wife to protect my life. The Bible says, if you are angry with your wife, the Lord will not hear your prayer. <laughs> That's the power of a wife. She can shut down your prayer life. That's in the Bible. So if your husband or your wife is not here, or they are here, you better talk to them every day and say, please keep the prayer lines open for me. <laughs> Everybody say relationships. You have to be wealthy in relationships. Number five, you must be wealthy in your influential life. Influence. You must be rich in the area of influence. God wants you to be wealthy in your capacity to bring change in the world. And you do that by making yourself valuable. What kind of influence do you have in your family, in your community, in your church? What is your area of influence? You must be wealthy in the account of influence. If my son and daughter wants money from any bank, all they have to do is use my name. They don't need to fill out forms. <laughs> they don't need to be investigated. The power of the wealth of influence. Jesus used this power often. He said, when you come to the Father, don't ask anything in your name. Because you don't have any influence. Come on, somebody, clap right there. He said, if you want to get something done, use what? My name, and my Father will give you everything, he says. I wonder if your name is good. Have you developed your name? Have you protected it? Do you safeguard it? And the last area of wealth that you must develop in your life if you're going to make a difference in your world, is in the area of community wealth. Community wealth. You must be wealthy in your community experience. And that means you must be able to improve the life of other people. If you help other people get what they want, you will develop wealth in the community. If you solve other people's problems, you'll become wealthy in the community. If you help the poor, the destitute, the drug addicts, the, the people who are abandoned, you are developing wealth in the community. If you reach out to those who cannot help themselves, you're becoming rich in community wealth. And believe me, friends, when your funeral comes, people will talk about your community wealth more than any other wealth. They will never talk about your money at your funeral. They will never talk about your car or the house you lived in. They'll always talk about your community wealth. And if you don't have community wealth, your funeral will be short. Your obituary is your community wealth. It's what you do for other people that makes you rich in the community. It's not the house you buy. Write this down, please. You are never remembered for what you saved. You are remembered for what you gave. We don't remember Steve Jobs' billions of dollars. We remember the iPhone he gave us. It's what he gave us, we remember. Not his money. Don't focus on material money. Focus on wealth in these areas. And you will never be forgotten. And number seven, generational wealth. The most important one. 
focus on becoming wealthy in the area of generations. The Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance, not just to his children, but to the children of those children. You are wealthy if your grandchildren can benefit from what you are doing. I repeat this. You are wealthy if your grandchildren can benefit from what you are doing. If you consume everything on yourself, you are poor. You know, my, my wife and I, when we were planning our future together, we decided we would plan to buy properties for our great-grandchildren because we wanted to prove the Bible. So we bought a lot of real estate before our kids are even married. Not for them, but for their children's children. We've already bought them. They paid for. So according to God, I'm a good man. A good man does what? Leave an inheritance to his children's children. Generational wealth. If everything dies with you, you are a failure. If you leave a mortgage for your children to pay, you are a bad man, not a good woman. Ah, it's quiet now. See, in the kingdom of God, you must think generational all the time. Leave your children a blessing, not a curse. Leave them assets, not a deficit. Some of you are praying for God to bless you with material resources. And God is refusing to give it to you because he was waiting for this session. Because he knew you were not ready for wealth. You would waste it. You would consume it on yourself. True wealth is in these seven areas. Go home and teach them to your sons and daughters. Let your children see this list and tell them, my dear daughter and son, this is wealth. First, become rich toward God. Then, let your soul become wealthy. Read and study and learn and grow and buy Dr. Monroe's books. Develop your physical body. Don't smoke, don't drink. Don't look at evil things. Don't read evil material. Don't consume drugs. Don't abuse your body with no sleep. Don't have sex out of marriage. Take care of your body. Become wealthy in your physical body. Tell them where wealth is. And notice on that list, I don't have money. Because money is not wealth. I hope you will never forget me today. Take me into your future. I am a wealthy man. Because my son and my daughter are overseeing my investments. Imagine the feeling I have. That my son and daughter will protect what I worked for. That's wealth. That my wife loves me still. That's wealth. That my board has been with me for 35 years. The same board. That's wealth. That my friends who I've had are still with me for 50 years. This is wealth. And the new friends I'm gaining can be assets to my life. This is wealth. Write this down, please. Wealthy thinking. I'm going to see now who's in the room. There are three types of people in the world. There's poor people, rich people, and wealthy people. They are completely different. If you want to know how poor people think, and rich people think, and wealthy people think, then write these down. Poor people always think about money. Don't look now. There's one right behind you. Don't look. Keep looking at me. Everything they talk about is money. 
I got enough. I need more. I need to get raised. I need more money. I don't have enough. I can't pay this. Oh, if I had some more money. Oh, God, give me money. Oh, bless me money. It's money, money. These are poor people. Rich people are different. They think about things. This is my car. This is my suit. This is my house. Do you like my bag? Look at my, look at my shirt. I got a nice blouse. Look at my shoes. Not on tennis. Look at that nice building I built. Look, they talk about things. Look at my boat. Look at my yacht. These are rich people. They are crazy people. That's all they talk about. About what they have. But wealthy people are different. Wealthy people think about ideas. This is where God lives. This is the arena where God wants you to come. God sent you to this meeting to get ideas, to get new principles of his work and his word. A man with ideas is always rich. A poor man is a man who has no ideas. So wealthy people don't think about money. They never talk about their things. They talk about ideas. They give people ideas. They discuss ideas. This is the level of kingdom thinking. Are you listening to me? Yes. I'm giving you the secret to coming out of poverty in your country. You must stop looking for money. Money is not the problem. The kingdom of God is not built on money. It's built on ideas. But for you spiritual people, let me explain it to you. Okay. Hey boys, say John chapter 1. Okay, write John chapter 1 down on your notes. John chapter 1, verse 1. There's a verse that you think you know. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Wait a minute now, this is deep stuff here. And then it says, All things were made by the Word. Okay, it's good. Verse 12, and the word became flesh. Wow. Boy, this word must be important, eh? Okay, write the word word down in your language, word. The word word in this verse is a Hebrew word translated into a Greek word, Greek New Testament. It's the word logos. L-O-G-O-S. Write it down. Let's scribble. Logos. The word logos. Do you know what it means? It means expressed idea. Write it down. Expressed idea. This verse of scripture is very difficult to translate. Because it doesn't make sense in your language. For example, here's the way it would be read. In the beginning was God's expressed idea. God's idea was God. And God's idea created everything. <laughs> and God's idea became a flesh and dwelt among us. See, I told you, the most powerful thing on earth is idea. God sent idea to save the world. Because the world had the wrong ideas. Jesus Christ is God's idea in a body. You are as poor as your ideas. You are as rich as your ideas. Jesus Christ created all things. Okay. Ideas create. Say it. So the Bible says all things were made by who? Him. Him who? The word. The word who? Ideas expressed. Do you know that everything in this room was first an idea. Your shoe was first an idea. Your dress was first an idea. Your watch was first an idea. Your iPad was first an idea. This building was first an architectural idea. This meeting was first an idea. Everything begins as an idea. So no idea, no thing. Small idea, small thing. Big idea, big thing. <laughs> so I wonder which one are you? Are you poor? 
Are you rich? Or are you wealthy? I'm not sure, but we'll find out. Oh boy. Write this down, please. Money is pursued. People pursue money. Riches is accumulated. But wealth is different. Wealth is created. And they are different. God doesn't want you to pursue money. And he doesn't want you to accumulate things. We read it a moment ago. A man's life does not consist in the things that he accumulates. If you need things to feel important, you are poor. You don't need things to feel important. You make things important because they come into your life. But wealthy people create money. This is why in the middle of a global crisis, <laughs> wealthy people don't panic. They think. If you study Jesus, every time he was caught in a crisis, he had a plan. You think. You don't panic. You think. It takes the same energy <laughs> to worry as it takes to plan. So use your energy properly. Panic takes energy. Planning takes energy. So convert your energy. I have built a multi-million dollar organization. I have been sitting at board meetings all my life. I am on the boards of hospitals and banks and insurance companies. and We sit in meetings with big issues. And I always sit in the meetings. And I am chairman of some of those banks or those board meetings of hospitals. And my job is to make sure that there are solutions. That's why they want me to be chairman. Because they know this guy never panics. Why? He's in the kingdom of God. He has access to wisdom they don't have. Glory, hallelujah. When Pharaoh asked Joseph, where did you get this wisdom? Because he knew it didn't come from the University of Egypt. Joseph says, my God. Everybody say it. My God gives me wisdom. That means God gave me this idea of digging holes in the desert and putting the wheat in the holes. It was a God idea. It was a business idea. It saved the economy of Egypt. Another thought to write down. Money is collected. Poor people are always collecting money. They save it in their bosom. Save it under the mattress. Save it in a hole outside the tent. <laughs> Always saving stuff. Rich people store money. They like to hide it in banks, hide it in investment companies. But wealthy people are different. They literally take money and they multiply it. Rich people multiply money. Say multiply. They grow money. I want you to go home and ask God for wisdom to multiply everything you have. There's always more in what you have. When we were building our building for our ministry to meet enough meetings in, we designed the largest building in the island. And we built it. And I told the board, we will not build this building as a church building. We're going to build this as a community center. So we designed this beautiful building and we named it not a church name. We call the building the Diplomat Center for Diplomats because we are kingdom people and we are ambassadors. An ambassador is a diplomat. So we designed the building, beautiful auditorium, first class lobby with tiles and we call it the Diplomat Center, the bathrooms with marble, nice. Beautiful parking lot, lights. And every church attacked me. They put me in the newspapers. The preacher said that I was a cult because I didn't have a steeple on the building, didn't have pews in the building, 
didn't have an altar, didn't have candles, there was no cross in the building. They said, you are not from God. No problem. But what they didn't know was, I'm a businessman. And I realized, I got to pay this building off debt free. So we designed the building in a way that it can be used for any function. We put first class technology in it. Television, cameras, lights, audit. Audit, uh, audio equipment, big stage, first class. Now, our building is the number one building being used by the government of our country, by the university's graduations, high school commencements, and they got to pay us plenty of money. <laughs> Clap. Clap. Now, let me explain why. Some of you pastors built a church building. You only use it twice a week. You should be ashamed of yourself. That means for five days, that building is sitting there generating no revenue. You have to pay for the blocks and the bricks. You got to pay for the electricity. The building is dead for five days, producing nothing. You are abusing God's resources. <laughs> Wealth multiplies. The rich man says, look at our church building. Look how beautiful it is. Look at the blocks. And Jesus said, not a one of them <laughs> will remain on one another. He laughed at the building because they were worshipping the building instead of using it. How do you think? There was a lady that came to my office. And this lady, listen this woman, real story. She came to my office, she was weeping. And she told my secretary, I have to see Dr. Munro now, or I am going to die. Well, thank God my wife didn't need to see me at the same time. Because there would have been a funeral. You get that next week. So I let her come in the office, she sat down, and she just sat on the chair. <laughs> She said, Dr. Munro, this is it. My life is over. And she began to weep. And I said, what happened? And she said, oh, I got two children, no husband. And I just lost my job. And I have no income. And this is my last paycheck. I don't know what to do. I'm going to die. And she's weeping. And I said to her, why are you crying? She said, you didn't hear what I said. I just lost my job at the hotel. They laid me off and I have no money and I only got two children to feed and rent to pay and light to pay and water to pay. And she's weeping. And I said, my dear, you have no problems. You're thinking wrong. She said, what do you mean? I said, uh, listen, I said, do you have a oven in your house? Yes. How often do you use it? Every Sunday. I said, you have an oven in your house that you paid for with God's money and you only use it once a week? Yes. I said, so for five, for six days, your oven is dead? Yes. I said, you ain't broke and you're not poor. You're just not thinking. What do you mean? I said, look. I said, take your last check. First, pay your tithes. What? I said, yeah, pay your tithes. <laughs> I said, protect yourself against heaven's problems. Yeah, okay. I said, now go to the food store with the rest of it. Buy some flour and some raisins and some oats. I said, because I know you. I remember you. You made me some cookies before. You got a gift. <laughs> yes. I said, make some cookies with the money. Bake them in your oven. And take them back to the hotel where you were fired from. And give free cookies to everybody in the hotel. <laughs> what? I said, 
obey me. She said, but this is my last check. I said, don't worry about it right now. Just follow my instructions. I'm giving you an idea. Everybody say idea. So she said, okay, pastor. So she ran home. She baked the cookies. Put them in little plastic bags. And took them back to the hotel. She gave some to the manager that laid her off. Free. Free cookies. Gave them to all the workers, all the administrators. Everybody had cookies. The next morning, she got phone calls. Any more cookies? <laughs> she said, yes, I'll make some. And she got orders in one day for 15 dozen cookies. She had to go out and buy more flour. She baked those cookies. Within one month, she was baking 50 dozen cookies a month. One year later, she had a staff of 22 people on a cookie factory. Today, her cookies are in all the big stores in the country. She is a multi-millionaire, and she pays tithes to the church. Come on, praise the Lord. Amen, right there. When she made her first $50,000 U.S., she came to see me, and she was dressed right down in all of her clothes, man. She was a CEO of a company, you know what I mean? A cooking industry. And she said, I just come to tell you, thanks. She said, the best thing that ever happened to me was being fired. <laughs> Today, she's the number one cookie woman in the country. Driving in a fine car, never sought for money. She never looked for money. She got an idea. And then she gave me an envelope. She says, this is the person they tell you thanks. And when she left, I opened the envelope. Hallelujah. 10,000 US dollars. I said, thank you very much, Lord. And I said, Lord, please give me more cookie women. She was sitting on wealth in her house. It was in an oven she wasn't using. I wonder what's in your house. You are not poor. You need to think. Let me close with a scripture. Genesis chapter 26. Does God want you wealthy? Let's find out. It says in Genesis chapter 26 verse 12, Isaac planted crops in that land, and the same year he reaped a hundredfold, because the Lord blessed him. That was in this land right here. The man became what? Rich. Okay, that's a, that's a, he was no longer poor, he became rich. That's the second level. But watch God. It says, and his wealth what? Continued to grow. He moved into wealth now. And became what? Very, not rich, wealthy. That means he shifted from material to ideas. He had so many flocks and herds and employers, staff. He hired other people, gave them jobs because he pursued God's will for his life. And the Bible says the Philistines, what? Envied him. My question is, how many rich people envy you? And this is the problem. Paul says, if you're going to win the Jew, you've got to make him jealous. How do you make a rich man jealous? <laughs> I'm going to leave that right there. You figure it out all by yourself. You are very smart people. The Philistines envied him because God made him wealthy. Therefore, God does not give wealth. Let's read it. Deuteronomy 8 verse 17. God says, when you become wealthy, you may say to yourself, my hands and my strength have produced this wealth for me. But that's not true, he says. Remember the Lord. For it is he, watch this, who gives you what? Not wealth. 
the ability to produce wealth. Wow. God doesn't give money. He gives ideas. I'm going to leave you now. But I want you to take your pen and write down this simple list. The word ability, here's what it means. It means ideas. It means schemes, concepts, and projects. God will give you ideas. He will give you schemes. He will give you concepts. He will give you the ability to produce wealth, he says. If you produce something, it can never run out. If you can produce something, you always have it. Poor people <laughs> lose money. Rich people lose things. Wealthy people keep producing. Keep producing. God says, I don't want you to pray for something that runs out. Pray for something that keeps producing. Ideas keep producing. I met Bill Gates for the first time in Tacoma, Washington. I was speaking at a leadership conference and his assistant was there. And when she heard me speak, she was on his board. She came to me and said, that was the best information I ever heard about leadership, she says. I want you to meet Mr. Gates. What you are teaching, we need to program this into our systems. I was so surprised. I said, yes, ma'am. I'd like to meet Bill Gates. Who wouldn't like to meet Bill Gates? So the next day, <laughs> she set up lunch, Tacoma, Washington, and we went out there. That's where his house is, you know, in Washington out there. And we went for lunch. And I was so humble. We met at this beautiful restaurant. And, you know, he's such a humble guy. I had on a t-shirt, blue jeans. Richest man in the world, t-shirt, blue jeans, tennis shoes. Only poor people dress up. Anyhow, listen. <laughs> Don't look now, there might be some around you. <laughs> so we had this awesome lunch together, and I was so thrilled to be with him, as I was with Nelson Mandela and many other leaders. And I, I learned a lesson. Here it is. Whenever you are with people who are successful, never talk about yourself. Ask questions. I just gave you some good advice. Write it down. When you are with successful people, don't talk about yourself. Ask questions. And for the one hour and 55 minutes, I had the wealthiest man in the world sitting with me. And I used every minute asking questions. One of my questions to him was, why did you refuse to stay on your own board? It's an interesting question. He said, huh. He said, you're a very smart guy. I said, I know I'm smart, but I want to know why you're smart. <laughs> why did you, you see, the board asked him to come on the board. So he said, okay. And he went on the board of Microsoft. He lasted for one year. He said, I hate this job. And I wanted to know why he left the board of his own company. His answer was very simple. He said, because I'm not a board man, I'm an ideas man. He said, when I was on the board, I stopped creating. And Microsoft became a victim. So I resigned from my own board. He said, to do what I love the most, thinking. Maybe your board is your problem. Maybe the people that you are around who talk to you are helping your poverty. Show me your friends and I will show you your future. God says, I don't give money and I don't give wealth. I give you the ability to produce it. Stand up on your feet. I want to pray for your mind. Tell your neighbor this is the end of poverty. Tell your neighbor, I don't want to be rich. I want to be wealthy. 
Stand up, please. Thank you. Put your hand on your head, both hands on your head. Just put it on your head. What you're doing now, I did this 41 years ago. I put my hand on my head, and everything changed. I prayed for God to give me what he gave Solomon. Will you, for the first time in your life, stop praying for things and pray for something else? Pray for divine wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and divine ideas. Go ahead, ask God right now. Ask him to forgive you for pursuing money. Ask him to forgive you for accumulating riches. Ask him to give you the spirit of wealth. That you will go home and create answers for problems. You will solve problems and not become one. That you will give solutions that will be valuable. Ask God to open your eyes to see a banquet in five loaves and two fish. Ask him to give you the insight to see a table in a tree. Ask him to show you the ability to see shoes in a cow. Oh God, raise up from among these people ideas dispenses i pray that wealth will be in their house forevermore and that they will return home with a new mind and a new idea to transform their families may poverty never live in your house again may your mind always be filled with divine